My name is Dane Johansson. I'm a pastor at Agros Reformed Baptist Church in Gilbert, Arizona. Uh, we're a Reformed Confessional Baptist Church. So are you a little nervous about traveling with this uh, international criminal, Pastor Anderson? It's, it is what it is. And uh, having known you and gotten to know you over the past, you know, couple months, uh, I have no issue with it personally. My name is Steven Anderson. I'm the pastor of Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. And I'm setting out with a couple of friends of mine, Brother Peter Tremeles, Pastor Dane Johansson. And we are going to Cyprus, which is a Greek-speaking country in the Mediterranean Sea, right off the coast of Turkey. And our goal with this trip is to demonstrate that the Greek language of the New Testament is a living language. It's a film about the continuity of the Greek language, that Biblical Greek and Modern Greek are not separate languages, but that the, the way the Biblical Greek in seminary, uh, the way it's taught, um, really needs to be revamped and reformed. We're going to go out there on the mean streets of Cyprus and we're going to preach the gospel to the lost. And the only Bible we're going to use is the New Testament in its original Greek. The oldest example of Greek literature that we have today is the poetry of Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and also other epic poetry of that era, poems by Hesiod, the so-called Homeric hymns, etc. Well, that is the most difficult form of Greek, being the most ancient, and the fact that it's poetry makes it a lot harder because poetry is always gonna be more complicated than prose, okay? So then after Homeric Greek, you have what's known as Classical Greek or Attic Greek. This is the dialect of Athens. Athens is in Attica, so it's called Attic Greek. And this would be around the 5th century BC that Classical Greek had its heyday. Okay, so we've moved a few hundred years forward in time. By the time we get to the Bible though, 1st century AD, it's no longer Classical Greek, now it's Koine Greek or Kine Greek. And the word Kine in Greek simply means common because this was the common language of a very large portion of the world. This was a universal second language or lingua franca throughout the Roman Empire. So because it was a universal second language, it became simplified. And that's why Biblical Greek is so much easier than Classical Greek. So a lot of people will mix up Classical Greek and Biblical Greek and they'll try to say, oh, Biblical Greek is so hard because Ancient Greek is a different language. Wrong, okay? This is all one language. The Reformation era, scholars, translators, etc., they did not just only study Biblical Greek. They studied Modern Greek, Homeric Greek, Classical Greek, everything in between. They took a holistic approach. They viewed it as one language and they learned the whole language. The men who made these translations of the Reformation era into the vulgar tongues and the, the, the common tongues of the people, instead of being locked away in Latin anymore, they were able to translate afresh from Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic right into the languages of the people, whether that's with uh, English, with Tyndale, and then leading on through the King James Bible translators or you know all the other common languages, the Dutch Stockton Vertaling, the Luther Bible. We we have all of these amazing translations. Now, how did these men learn how to translate these documents into the languages of their mother tongue? We're standing right here today in Constantinople, also known as Istanbul, and when all of the Christians fled, the Greek-speaking Christians from Byzantium fled from this very place into Europe during the Muslim invasion, they brought with them all of their Greek resources, all of their Greek knowledge, their own tongue that they had spoken from the time they were children. 
Uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet conquered Constantinople in 1453, and many Greek people moved to Italy after the after he conquered Istanbul, Constantinople, and uh, many of them went to Italy. So they started Renaissance in there, and they brought all the knowledge, all the uh, belief of like all the Greek belief to uh, there. That's why Renaissance started in the 15th century in Europe. They, when they learned Greek, they learned it from a Greek speaker who had just fled from Byzantium, who had just fled from modern-day Istanbul, and now brought with him all of his knowledge of the Greek language. That's the way they learned every language back then. Uh, you, you simply met someone who spoke that language, you shared life with them and, and learned their language from them, and then learned how to get the intricacies of the grammar and reading it and speaking it and writing it after that. For instance, Erasmus. Gives, a, gives an explanation of how he learned uh, Greek. He learned it from a Greek speaker, somebody who knew it and spoke it as their own living mother tongue. And then from there, once he got a, a foundation in the language of the, the, the modern tongue of his time, he then went into just extensive reading of the ancient authors. This is the reason that we're advocating this very method. And that method is to take this language as a holistic thing, not break it up into five or six or seven or eight different languages, but realize that Greek is Greek is Greek. The important thing to understand is that this is one language, okay? This is one language, Greek. We're not talking about five different languages. You know, there's Homeric Greek and the Classical Greek, Biblical Greek, Byzantine Greek, and Modern Greek. Five different languages. No, it's one language. And if you're really going to be an expert on Biblical Greek, you would have to learn the whole language. From Homer to Modern Greek and everything in between, if you really want to have the full grasp of the language and be on the level of the Reformation era scholars that gave us great Bibles like the King James Version. Okay, those guys didn't just only study Kine Greek. They actually knew Homer, modern, and everything in between. Okay, that is the level of scholarship that they had when approaching a Bible translation. The guys who are translating the Bible today, most of them, if you handed them the Iliad and the Odyssey, they wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it. And if you dropped them off in modern day Greece, they wouldn't even be able to order souvlaki. One of the first things we did upon arriving in Cyprus was to sit down the three of us and read the Bible together. Now, Brother Peter is a fluent native Greek speaker, but he's never read the New Testament in Greek. So we decided to start reading in the book of Revelation. He's going to start, then me, then you. Os e martirise ton logon tu theou, que tin martirian Isu Christu, os ateide, o pro totokos, ek ton necron, que o archon ton vasileon tisis. Ego imito alpha, que to omega, o protos, que o escatos, que o vlepis grapson is figlion, que pemson tes epta ecclesias, que to agelo tis en pergamo ecclesias grapson. Tade legi o echon ta epta penebmata tu theu, que tus epta asteras, idasu ta erga, o echon us accusato tito pnevma legi tis ecclesias, que to angelo tis en Philadelphia ecclesias grapson, tade legi o agios, o alithinos, o echon tin clida tu David, o anigon que udis clii. O nikon doso afton, cathise metemu en to throne. Os cago enikisa que e cathisa metatu patosmu en to throne afton. So that was your first time reading an extended passage in Kini Greek? Yes. And you understood pretty much all of it or most of it? or? I, I would say most of it. Like I said, you know, maybe. Uh, you know, there's a few words that, that you would look at and, you know, right off the bat, I, I couldn't tell you what it meant. Mm. But if you read the whole sentence, mm. you actually can understand the whole meaning and you know what that word says. So what if someone told you, no, actually, th there's no way that, you know, a modern Greek can understand this. This is a totally different language. What would you say to that? I would scoff at that. I would laugh at them and tell them that that is completely, utterly ridiculous. Because you can understand it, no problem. Yes. Any Greek can understand. Without any specific study in Biblical Greek, you as a modern Demotiki Greek-speaking person can just pick this up and read it, no problem. Yep. yep. I would say 
we could pick anybody on the, off the street and show them that book and tell them to read it and they would be able to tell us what it says. That's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> It was late in the evening, so we headed into the downtown area to evangelize. And we met up with a local guy named Andreas who listened to my sermons online. And the first person who was willing to listen to the gospel was actually a guy running a tattoo parlor. The Bible says right here, Tagar opsonia tisamatias thanatos te dejarisma tu theo zoe eonios en Christo isu to kirio imon. Kiri, ti me di piin. In a sotho, ideipon, pistevon, epiton kirion isun riston, kesothisi si geoikosu. So, what's the Bible saying that we have to do to be saved, according to that verse? Just to believe on Jesus, right? Does that say that we have to go to church to be saved? No. No. Does it say that we have to live a good life? No. Stop sinning. Just pistevon, epiton kirion isun riston, kesothisi. Uto gad igapisen o theos ton cosmon, oste ton yonaf tu ton monogeni edoken, in a pas o pistevon isafton, mi apolite al echi zoin eonion. Amin, amin, lego imin, o pistevon iseme, echi zoin eonion. Do you understand everything I'm saying so far? Tagar opsonia tisamatias thanatos to the charisma to theu zoi eonios en Christo isu to kirio imon. So, charisma. Tisimeni en a charisma. This is like a gift. Yeah, it's a gift, right? So, if God is giving us zoi eonion as a gift, if he's giving us eternal life as a gift, it's free. We don't have to pay for it, right? Tafta egrapsa imin tis pistevusin is to onoma tu iu tu theu in a idite otizoin ekate eonion. Guy didn't get saved, but it was a good seed planted. What did you think about that encounter right there? Um, that, that was awesome. Not only was the gospel preached and it was revealing of the state of Cyprus, but I think the biggest thing for me is seeing that Pastor Stephen uh, talked from this book the entire time. All the verses were shared from the uh, Koine Greek New Testament. There was never any mention of, I, what book is this? I, I don't understand what's being said. Can you say it in modern Greek, anything like that? It was just, you know, read it. What does that mean? Oh, it means to believe. I'm supposed to believe in Jesus Christ. There was never any talk about it being some different language. It, that's the most revealing thing to me. The guy um, didn't even bat an eye. Didn't even bat an eye. It was as if, you know, it was his language, because it is. So, uh, it's almost like modern Greek speakers can understand the New Testament. Modern Greek speakers can understand the Koine Greek New Testament, no problem. No problem. No doubt about it. I had a little bit of doubt, now I don't. Completely, completely gone. Next, we talked to a group of eight teenagers, and three of them actually ended up getting saved. Pandes gar imarton, ke isterunde tis doxis tu theu. Tagar opsonia tis amartias thanatos to the charisma to theu zoi eonios en Christo isu to kirio imon. Kiri. Ti me di piin in a sotho, ide ipon, pistevson epi ton kirion isun riston, ke sothisi esi ke o ikosu. So what do you have to do to be saved? Exactly. So did the Bible say you have to join a church to be saved? Uto gar igapisen o theos ton kosmon, os to ton yon aftu ton monogeni edoken, in a pas o pistevon isafton, mi apolite, Al echi zoin eonion. He gave his son so that what? Paso pistevon. Paso pistevon is afton, mi apolite al echi zoin eonion. Amin, amin, lego imin, o pistevon is a me, echi zoin eonion. Whoever so believes has life forever. Yes, whoever believes has eternal life. Tagar opsonia tis amartias thanatos to the charisma. To the charisma to theu, zoi eonios en Christo isu to kirio imon. So did that kind of surprise you a little bit? Yeah, it did. I mean, I didn't expect like, you know, 
I didn't expect people to get saved so easily just by hearing the gospel once. You asked me, like, should I go up to those people? And I was like, ah, I don't think they're going to listen. But you did, and, you know, thank God you did. Um, but, yeah, at least, you know, I was really blown away by that. And I just think that, you know, those people obviously were looking for something like that. They were looking for, you know, they were cut some question in their mind, perhaps. And when they heard the gospel, that they, they understood that the gospel was the answer to those questions. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it really, you know, it's really significant that only three people out of like a very big group when, uh, came to here. It just highlights the fact that we have to, you know, preach to those who are interested mm -hmm. and you know, do not mind about other people. Maybe, yeah, because you know. we st we started with about ten yeah. people, yeah, and then yeah. right away when I started preaching the gospel, two or three people bailed. Yeah, and then a lot of other people stayed and heard the entire gospel. But then when it came time to accept Christ as Savior. There were only yeah. three that said, yeah, we believe. And there was a lot of peer pressure for them to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was. Their buddies were kind of like, all right, let's go. And they're like, no, let's do this. Yeah, so that was cool, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. We also wanted to sit down with Andreas and see how well he, as a Greek teenager, understood the Koine Greek of the New Testament. Then the Ava says, pote tin canidia thikin sta elenica. Etsi denine. Ne, ne. All right. Arhi tu evangeliu isu Christu. Iu tu theu, os yegrapte endis profites idu, ego apostelo ton angelon mu pro prosopu su, os kadaskevasi tin odon su embrostensu, foni voondos endi erimo, etimasate tin odon kiriu, ephias piite tas tribus aftu. So, Catalavenis? Ne, ne, Catalavenis. Catalavenis panda? Ne, ine, ine di Afrodikia abodin elni abodin nea nel giglosa, but alla ine poli paromia. Ara kakios pou poria diavazi nea elni kam poria diavazi ke tin elni tin glosan skenis diatikis. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ke evaptizondo pandes endo Jordani potamo ip aftu exomologumeni. Yeah, I mean, I can understand it perfectly. I mean, there's no issue at all. Like, for somebody who speaks modern Greek fluently, there is no issue at all in understanding this text. What if I... No issue. So, no. so what, if, what if somebody told you, oh yeah, you know, Biblical Greek is a completely different language. It's not, it's what would you not, say to that? No, that, that's, that's false. It's not a well, well, this was a Bible college professor who teaches Greek for a living. Are you saying that he's lying? Well, I'm saying that maybe he, he's not informed, or maybe he's, he's not informed. Yeah. So, but maybe he should get informed yeah. before teaching Greek for a living. Yeah. Do you think that'd be a good idea? Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm going to read it to you in the Erasmian pronunciation that they teach in Bible college. Arche tu euangeliu iesu Christu huiu tu theu hos gegraptai entis profitais idu ego apostello ton angelon mu pro pro pra pra sopusu. Has katakewase tain hadansu empras thensu. Do you understand no, any of that? No, not a word. If I was not reading this, like as. So if you didn't look at it, you yeah, would have no, no idea. I have no idea. What language would you think I was speaking? I don't know. Just some kind of like English. Some kind of. <laughs> 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 Some kind of weird English accent, I don't know. Or just some, like Latin, I don't know. Something Latin? Like <laughs> so in, in seminary, I've taken multiple years of seminary Greek. And I have a lot of friends and pastors and everything that are still, and even teach seminary Greek. And they can't, they can't speak, they can't even understand or read Corne Greek. Or modern Greek. They can't say hello, my name is nothing. Yeah. There's some some areas are moving that way, but I think a lot of it has to do with the pronunciation method they've used. Yeah, which you, yeah, yeah. you you said you're familiar with some of the ways they do that. Yeah, they use basically um, a pronunciation which I think has been constructed in yes. the West. Yes. So it's not like the original Greek pronunciation. Yes. And it's used by no one in, in Greece or you know anywhere by anyone who speaks Greek as their mother tongue. Do you and think that it ever uh, was spoken that way? Pronounced that way? No, because I mean, if it was, then something profound happened and everything right. changed like radically. But I, right, don't right. Think that, I don't think that this was the case, no. Yeah. yeah. The next morning, we went out soul winning door to door, and a lot of people weren't interested, but we finally found a young guy who was very interested, but he didn't speak any English whatsoever. 
so I had to give them the gospel 100% in Greek. One of my goals for this trip was to be able to do that by the end of the trip, but I kind of got thrown into it on the second day. We got somebody saved with no English. Wow. 100% Greek. Nice. The guy had a lot of patience. Because I was, you know, I was stumbling and stammering and everything. Yeah, he was like a young guy. Like, woo! We were, we were like so excited though that we didn't, he didn't know any English. And he got saved. That was a miracle, because I was like stumbling through it. But I, you know, I went through the verses no problem, but explaining was hard. He, he communicated the gospel at the end to us, like perfectly. Like showing that he understood everything. And, and he said, it's a free gift, I can't lose it. And he said, if it was based on how good we are, the whole world would be doomed. So he understood that. Oh, he understood everything. Yeah, he explained it really well. It took a half hour just to kind of like stammer through it. And, and I even had to, I didn't know, I had to mime like, because I was talking about like parents spanking their kids. So I was like, what's it called when they, you know, the parents, they do this with their kids when they're bad? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, so, so then it, it was like, uh, there no, I guess, yeah. is the yeah. word. So we learned a new verb, there no. Yeah. I spank. Yeah. All right, that's <laughs> You got some ace, eh? Yeah. Awesome. But we were like, you know, we were stumbling too, like, you know, just trying to remember everything. So was it all in Greek? Yeah, 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 obviously. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, we have the critical text here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm you prayed with her, yeah. You prayed with her? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So you guys got you guys got somebody saved 100% Greek? Yes. Yeah. Of course, you guys are Greek. We are, yeah. <laughs> I, was still, I was still stumbling, though, too. You know? Man, that's awesome. Yeah. So, oh, man, that's cool. Yeah. Man, cool. praise the Lord. That was a great morning. Hi, my name is Stefan, I'm from Geneva, Switzerland. And I just arrived this morning, and I'm very happy to be in Cyprus. I've been a follower of uh, Pastor Anderson for some years now on YouTube, and when I, I saw that you were in Cyprus, I, I took the first flight. I was glad to see you, because obviously it's, it's difficult to see you in Europe these days. So are you so, ready to do some soul winning? Yeah, yeah I hope to. Uh, I like to, to learn soul winning, because I've never been really doing it. And I'd like to start as a silent partner, know the, know the drill and, uh, and, and start doing it. Because I think it's the first works, we need to, to win souls, it's, uh, it's the fruits that we can bear and uh, it's very important for me. It's something that has been forgotten by the evangelical church, especially in Europe. People don't do soul winning and uh, it's a shame, it's a real shame. Alright, I'm Brother Jack. Uh, I saw a video on Pastor Anderson's channel. Uh, that he's in Cyprus. I live in Scotland, obviously the pastor's banned from the UK. Um, I've been listening to his preaching for about a year and a half. Uh, I actually ended up getting saved through his ministry, praise God. F -f Flown out here, so I'm going to learn how to do some, some good soul winning for the Lord. And uh, Definitely not going to learn any Greek, I don't think, but Pastor Anderson is going to sharpen up on his Greek. But uh, yeah, so here we are. And uh, I have some grub and very happy to be with, 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 with my brothers in Christ. So. One of the things that I would notice here too is that you know the priests, um, you know they tend to tell the youth and they tell the people, you know of their faith that they can't question uh, the Orthodox faith and they can't question the beliefs that that have been instilled in them. Why do I have to go to confession? Why do I have to listen to the priest? Why do I have to have, you know, these good works? Or why do I have to get baptized as a baby? And they, it seems like you know the priests just tell them blindly that they have to believe in that and they have to do those things in order to be saved and when we tell them that none of that is necessary 
Um, all you have to do is just believe on Jesus and you shall be saved. And they hear that and that's like such a profound message for them because they feel like they've been lied to all this time. And, um, you know, I just really want to make sure that, you know, when we bring the gospel to them that they get to hear the truth because I feel that after so many years, you know, that they just grow up believing that everything that the priest tells them is the truth and they feel that the standards that the Orthodox religion sets for them is so unattainable that they just give up. And so when they hear that, you know, God's salvation is free, you know, as long as they believe that it's that gift for them to receive, you know, they're just so happy to hear that. So how did you end up uh, coming out of the Orthodox Church yourself? So there was a lot of things that, that I saw in the Bible that, you know, just didn't measure up. Like, you know, for example, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, a bishop has to be the, you know, the husband to one wife and he has to be sober and temperament and he has to be able to rule his own house. But yet the priests uh, can't be married and, you know, once they've been ordained. And so when I started asking my priest that question, and I said, you know, why is it that the Orthodox teach that you have to be celibate in order to be a bishop? They tell me, you know, you can't question that. You know, that's something that you're not allowed to question. Um, you know, the other thing that, you know, we talk about how, you know, the Bible tells us that you should call no one father but your father in heaven. And when, when you ask them, you know, why must I call you father if the Bible tells us call no one but our father in heaven father, they say that's the way it is. You don't question that. So, and that drove you to leave the Orthodox Church? Yes, that, you know, especially the fact that they didn't want me to question the faith is what led me to believe that, you know, this is not, you know, a faith that I should believe in because they don't take the Bible at face value. They're teaching things that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. And then when you start asking questions, they tell you that you're not allowed to have those questions. They tell you that, you know, you have to believe whatever they tell you and if you don't believe that, then you're just being blasphemous against the Orthodox traditions. So today I met a man from Ethiopia and uh, he had a very similar story to share, um, such as the one that I have, my testimony. And uh, you know, we were talking and he had mentioned that his father uh, was in the Orthodox church in Ethiopia. And uh, he went to the priest and a started asking him questions about their traditions. You know, why do we have to make the sign of the cross? why do we have to bow to icons? And the priest told him, you know, you do not get to question any of those things. And so that gentleman decided that this was not the religion for him because he felt that he was being deceived. And he felt that because the priests were, uh, you know, not allowing him to question the faith in any way whatsoever. And uh, he saw that it was contradicting the Bible. So he decided to pull completely out of the Orthodox faith and he took his whole family with him and they all ended up believing. They all ended up becoming evangelicals. So that was, you know, very profound to me to hear that, you know, somebody else would have that same testimony as I had, uh, you know, and why he left the Orthodox faith, similar to why I did. So yeah, like I was baptized as a baby when I, uh, when I was young, I was baptized in the Orthodox Church, but I was re never really a part of it. Uh, but then as I grew older, I started searching. I mean. And I started being interested in, in, in finding the truth and in actually understanding who God was, then I think that, I mean, through that searching, the Lord led me to believe the gospel. He led me to the gospel and He led me to believe in it. And He actually revealed to me how the Orthodox Church is not preaching what, what the Bible preaches.
we just had a great time out soul winning here. And I believe that the soul winning here in Cyprus is more receptive than the United States even. I mean, it's really easy to talk to people here. They're really friendly. And we just got four more people saved out there. And we were using the Greek New Testament for the Bible verses. And everybody understood it, no problem. And what was interesting is that even Romanians who are speaking Greek as a second language, but they're fluent in modern Greek, they understood the verses, no problem. So what was interesting, I was talking to three guys, and when it came down to the end, I spent about 25 minutes explaining the gospel to them. And when it came down to the very end, and I was asking them if they believed it, one of the guys wasn't even sure if Jesus died on the cross. You know, I said like, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? And he was like, eh, I don't know. The other two guys were like, yes, they for sure believed it. They understood the gospel. Everything was crystal clear to those two guys. So I prayed with those two guys, they got saved. But what was interesting is that the guy who wasn't even sure if Jesus died on the cross, he started like defending the Orthodox church at the end and saying, how can you not have icons in your church? You're being disrespectful to the saints by not having the icons and, and you know, it, it was just blew my mind how he's not even sure if Jesus died on the cross, but he's 100% sure that we better have those icons and we better, you know, honor the church and this and that. He had more confidence in the Orthodox Church than in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that's where a lot of people are at spiritually, unfortunately. But they're all, they're all willing and ready to receive. You can have, everyone here wants to talk. They're willing to talk. Yeah, even if they don't get saved, yeah. they're at least willing to listen. Right. Typically. There's, there's open doors everywhere. Yeah, the, the door is definitely open. And so, um, you know, we, we, we've demonstrated once again that they have no trouble understanding the Greek New Testament. So far, we've had the most success with the young men, you know, in their 20s, teenagers, that, that kind of youth demographic has been the most receptive to the gospel of everyone that we've talked to. So, so that's who we're focusing on because that's who wants to listen. I thought it was awesome when you were sharing with those two Romanian guys and the one of them that spoke fluent Greek and English and Romanian, obviously, when you were showing him the verses, even he, and we've seen that yesterday as well, even he had no trouble understanding Koine Greek. Right. It was, it was pretty cool because you even asked him specifically if he had trouble understanding or if he understood it all, and he was like, oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I said, are you having any trouble understanding this Greek? And he's yeah, like, Yeah, because no, it, no, it no sounded problem. like he was saying something I don't understand. And that's when you were like, well, what are you, are you, do you understand this? He's like, no, I understand that. He was just struggling with the concept. Yeah, yeah, He said, yeah. no, 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 the language is great. I understand what the Bible's saying. <laughs> he didn't I just, even ask. He didn't even mention, like, well, I know it's old, but He I didn't understand. even mention. No one no. has mentioned that. No, no. Has one person mentioned that on this whole trip? No. No one has said, well, that's a little archaic, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. No. You said he was very receptive to the Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, th I, I think it's very receptive. And I, I would love to see an army of soul winners come to Cyprus and Greece and preach the gospel. You know, why don't all these Bible college guys who are studying Greek in the seminary, why don't they get out here with the Greek New Testament and win some souls to Christ? And uh, you know what? If they really want to go deeper in Greek, why don't they use it out in the field? Yeah, I mean, the, the doctors, the medical doctors, the lawyers, they all have their little sabi or their little... Uh, hidden language uh, uh, that they use to, to keep their power, to keep the, uh, they, they need a special, uh, special language to, to show that they are different and to justify their honoraries and to, and I think for the theologian it's the same, they use big words, they use Greek, even though they don't speak Greek, but they need the special plus compared to you. And, so it uh, kind of gives them a one-up. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. They are, they are, they are a higher caste. They have a special knowledge that you don't have, and and actually, it's a fake knowledge. It's right. just a, a barnish, just a, a coating, nothing, nothing deep. And right. for Greek, I think it's the same. Uh, if they were really speaking Greeks, I think they would be able to manage in in Athens or on Cyprus or in real life. But they don't. They can't. Because I've even, since we've been on this trip, like just now, I forgot how to order some stuff. And uh, I forgot how to order some stuff in, in modern. And I said it in Koine and I got, I got what I asked for. So 
Uh, yeah, you can speak in. They'll, they'll, they probably they'll they, 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 they did giggle. They did giggle. But yeah. They understood. No, yeah. But when they when they're on the read, written page, they never giggle at the words themselves. Be- you know? it, because it's like if you said to them, "Wilt thou give me coffee?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. I beseech you that you would yeah. give me a little coffee <laughs> in my vessel. In my vessel. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. May I receive a small vessel of coffee? <laughs> they would still understand you. Yeah. You know. It'd just be weird. <laughs> yeah. And when these Bible college Greek scholars get together and talk about Greek, it's like a Star Trek convention. Like they're speaking Klingon or something, you know? Like it's just this weird language. It's not a real language that people actually speak, but it's just like this little secret knowledge that they have where they can talk to each other and they geek out on it like they're a Star Trek fan. But in reality, this is a real human language spoken by almost 14 million people. And that's how it needs to be learned and then you can actually use it in the real world and then you can actually appreciate it on a visceral level you know god created us as human beings with the ability to use language to speak to understand we have this innate ability that the animals don't have okay so we need to feel language when we speak english we're not diagramming sentences as we speak we speak from the heart and we speak by feeling We know how to talk and we can't always explain why, but we understand and speak our native tongue. And when you learn a foreign language, there's a watershed where you reach that level in another language where you just start to do it by feeling. And you don't have to think about the verbs. You don't have to think about the gender. You're just doing it by feeling. And that's true fluency, is where you can just read and speak by feeling. You get to a point where you're not translating anymore. You're just thinking in that language and you're able to speak and read just by feeling, intuitively. And we've all done that with our first language. And you get to a point when you study a second language where you cross that line. And man, that's an exciting place to be when you can cross that threshold and you reach that tipping point. And that's where learning a foreign language actually gets fun. Και έδωκε αυτόν ο δράκον τη δύναμη αυτού και τον θρόνο αυτού και εξουσία μεγάλη. Και είδω μια των κεφαλών αυτού ω εσφαγμένη θάνατο. Και πληγή του θανάτου αυτού εθεραπεύθη. Και θαύμασε όλη η γη ο πίσω του θηρίου. Και προσκενήσαν τον δράκονταν ω έδωκε εξουσία το θηρίο. Και προσκενήσαν το θηρίο λέγοντα: Τι όμοιο το θηρίο, τι δύναται πολεμεί, τι δύναται πολεμεί σε μετά αυτού. Και εδόθη αυτό στόμα λαλούν μεγάλα και βλασφημία. Και εδόθη αυτό εξουσία πηγή σε μήνα τεσσαράκοντα δύο. Και ένιξε το στόμα αυτό τη βλασφημία προ το Θεό. Βλασφημίσε το όνομα αυτού και την σκηνή αυτή. So, you can't understand any of that, huh? It's just all, it's, it's all modern Greek. Like, it's modern Greek with just slightly different words, but it's the same structure of sentences, the same grammar basically. So, you can understand all of it. You know, you have, if you have a couple of unknown words, you can look them up. So you can read this without a problem if you know modern Greek fluency. We just talked to uh, three young guys over here. They were from Bulgaria, but they're going to high school in the Greek language. So they've learned Greek as a second language. They were totally fluent in Greek. 
And so therefore they had no problem understanding the Greek New Testament. Two of them got saved. One of them said he wasn't really sure if he believed in it, but two of them got saved. So that was pretty cool. One of the points that we're trying to get across in this film is that you can kill two birds with one stone. If you're interested in learning New Testament Greek, you can actually read the Bible in its original language and you can win Greek people to Christ, which is a huge need. And honestly, this is one of the most receptive places I've ever gone soul winning. When it comes to talking to the young people, I mean, this is more receptive than soul winning in the United States. And usually when you go to Europe, it's less receptive. But here in Cyprus, it's actually more receptive. And I'm sure it would be the same way if we went to Greece because the culture is pretty much identical. You know, the people here consider themselves to be Greek people. And so I hope that people who watch this film don't just have a negative attitude like, oh, I don't think it can be done or it's too hard or why should I learn modern Greek if I just want to read the Bible, you know, uh, because of the fact that the modern Greeks are having a way easier time reading the Bible than your Bible college professor. And the disciple's not above his master, the servant's not above his Lord. If your Greek professor is struggling to read the New Testament in Greek, he obviously isn't going to be able to get you to your goal, if that's your goal. If your goal is to actually be able to read it fluently, he can't get you there because he's not there himself in most cases. Obviously, there are exceptions to that. But here in Greece, every teenager, you know, can understand it no problem. Είμαστε εδώ στον Όλυμπο της Κύπρου που είναι το ψηλότερο βουνό σε όλη την Κύπρο. Και το περιβάλλον εδώ διαφέρει πάρα πολύ από την θαλασσινή περιοχή. It, it's nothing like the landscape down by the ocean. Up here it is a proper forest and we're surrounded by all these beautiful trees. It smells great. There's a lot of fresh air. And the weather up here is gorgeous. Now down by the sea, it has been very hot because we're here in the summertime and it has been scorching. That's part of the reason why we've been doing a lot of our soul winning at night. And believe it or not, the best time to go soul winning here is like seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night if you're in a public place. You know, obviously wouldn't knock on people's doors at that time, but just going out into a public place, everybody wants to talk. Everybody's out at that time. In fact, if you go there in the afternoon or evening, barely anybody's around. You know, when you're going down the boardwalk or when you're going through the downtown areas where all the businesses are, it's pretty dead during the daytime and it just comes alive at night. And so we've been soul winning in the public streets around like 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night and everybody's out, everybody's ready to talk and nobody's even close to calling it a night. And one thing that I've learned about the Greek culture from being here is that Greek people love to talk. They are very social. And so everywhere you go, you see them sitting around and talking. And so that really works well for soul winning because when you walk up and strike up a conversation with people, people want to talk. And even when we're sitting at restaurants by ourselves talking, a lot of times people from other tables will come approach us and say, hey, what are you guys talking about? That sounds really interesting. What religion are you guys? And they'll jump into the conversation and then we give them the gospel. So a lot of times the fish are jumping into the boat. People are coming to us and striking up the conversation just because people here love to talk. And virtually everyone that we've won to Christ has been young, younger than myself, you know, 20s or teens. That's the demographic that is really receptive to the gospel here because I think that that generation feels alienated from the Orthodox Church. The, the preaching of the Orthodox Church does not resonate with them. The, they, they don't understand the traditions and I don't blame them for feeling disenfranchised in regard to the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox Church is bogus. And that's why we're here. If the Orthodox Church were doing its job, then we wouldn't even be here. The reason we're here is to preach the gospel that the Orthodox Church is not teaching. They teach a works-based salvation 
total idolatry, total false doctrine. We're shining the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ here. And it's just wonderful to see young people responding. So the biggest problem that I see with uh, the younger generation is that they're just completely disconnected from the church. The problem that uh, the Orthodox Church has is that everything is about tradition. So you have to go to confession, you have to attend church, and when you go to a church, the service doesn't even give you anything biblical. The only thing that they do is they follow what's called a liturgy, which is basically the same exact procession of steps, the same exact repeating of same words, and the same uh, just whole entire process of just doing this liturgy uh, for the whole time. So like, you could go to an Orthodox church on any given Sunday, and you would see the same exact liturgy being done um, as they would do the next week and the week after that and the week after that. They don't give you anything new. They don't give you any feeding spiritually. And the, the youth here, the people who live this religion, uh, they go to church and they feel that just by being in that church and just hearing those words and receiving what the priest tells them is what they need to do in order to get to heaven. And so they actually feel that if they're not going to church that they're actually committing a sin. But the problem is is that all of these uh, vain repetitions that go on in church are just things that doesn't resonate with uh, with the young people and so you know they feel that it's just not something that they can even accomplish and because of that they just go away from the church they're so far away from the church they don't even bother to attend because they've just pretty much given up on that in fact many of them even start to doubt they don't even believe that uh, what the church is teaching is true and they they start to lose their faith in God so it just really uh, is eye-opening for me to see just how starving the young people especially are to the message that we're giving them. When we uh, show them the Bible, they actually feel that uh, we're giving them something that the priest doesn't give them. Somebody commented on me saying, basically we need reform in the seminaries, how this is taught. You should learn modern Greek first and then read like study Kini after that, because here in Cyprus, even you know, 14 year olds at the skate park understand it perfectly fine. Tattoo, tattoo artists understand it perfectly fine, all this stuff. This guy says, I'm reading more about the living language approach and the reconstructed Koine pronunciation, and I'm, and I'm being convinced that it is the way forward. That said, we don't necessarily need to know how to ask for a glass of water in order to understand the New Testament. Well, don't they want to understand that scripture about giving a cup of cold water into one of these little ones? I mean, yeah, it's literally in the New Testament, yeah. so, I, okay. Um. So they're literally saying, they're literally saying, I can know Greek at such a low level that I can't even ask for a glass of water at a restaurant in Greece. I can still be able to expound and exegete the Bible in Greek, even though I know so little Greek that I can't even order a glass of water. Is that what they're actually saying? Unbelievable. Well, you don't know Greek. <laughs> what? I mean, that's the accusation. Let's keep, let, let, let's keep going. So some other guy chimes in and says, being able to use Koine conversationally isn't the point, which I never said it was. I just made a point that even when I'm speaking Kini to these people, they understand it. Yeah. Uh, nor is it necessary. I went through school with a girl from Cyprus, and she said that to speak Kini to her would be like someone speaking the King James English to me. Mastering the grammatical functions of the language for exegesis is all you need. Okay, but here's the thing. We never said to learn how to speak Koine Greek conversationally. What we said is learn how to speak modern Greek conversationally, and then you'll understand the Koine Greek. Because think about this. If someone wanted to read the King James Bible in English, if that were their goal, we wouldn't tell them, hey, you need to actually learn how to speak in King James English. We would tell them to get fluent in modern English and then read the King James, right? Because all of the contemporary English speakers in the United States of America can read the King James, no problem. They can understand the King James. Obviously, they have to look up the odd word. So we're basically saying, learn how to speak modern Greek, and then you'll be able to pick up the Greek New Testament and read it and understand it. What would you say 
because some of these people are arguing that all we would need to know, we don't need to be able to read the language fluently or speak the language fluently. All we need to do is have the ability to understand the syntax and the grammar of the language. Well, I would say that you can't understand the grammar and the syntax without learning the language. I mean, that's ridiculous. Can you imagine this in any other language? Well, all you really need to know is just Spanish grammar. You don't need to know how to speak Spanish. You just need Spanish grammar, and then you're the expert on what the Spanish Bible means because you studied Spanish grammar. I mean, that's ludicrous. That would only work in the world of Bible colleges and seminaries. In the real world, that level of language learning would be scoffed at. The fruit of such a methodology has obviously come short anyway. All these guys who are studying just the grammar and just the syntax and just looking up dictionary and lexical definitions don't read the Greek New Testament. They can't. So if that's just the goal is, is to be able to read the Greek New Testament and expound it and exegete it, yet their methodology has not led them to be able to do that, is it working? Yeah, because they're saying, oh, all you need to know is just the grammar and the syntax. Okay, so if you do their method, can we hand them a Greek New Testament and just on the fly, can they flip to any chapter? Are we going here? No. Can they flip to any chapter and just read it and tell us what it means? on the fly, no. So therefore, their method falls short. What they actually want to be able to do is stand up in front of their congregation and look smart and say, oh, well, this in the Greek actually means X, Y, and Z. And they want to just be puffed up and look smart without actually having to put in the work to learn the language. It's, it's laziness. They want, to, they want to get up and act like they know Greek without doing the real work and the study. Because frankly, learning a foreign language is a lot of work and takes a lot of study. So they don't want to do the work, but they want to just be these smart guys that stand up and expound Greek. And here's the thing. We don't think that somebody needs to learn Greek to understand the New Testament or expound the New Testament because we have a wonderful translation in English and that's all we need. I mean, you could live your whole Christian life and serve God and preach and read and study nothing but a King James Bible and live a full Christian life and earn Boku rewards in heaven. You don't have to learn Greek. Okay, but what we're saying is if you're going to talk about the Greek New Testament, if you're going to read the Greek New Testament, you better learn Greek. I mean, imagine that, right? I mean, is that really such a radical concept? If you're going to expound to us the Greek New Testament, you should have to actually understand Greek. You should actually have to be fluent in the language. Yeah, makes sense. What a, what a concept. Yeah. <laughs> Here's my goal. My goal is to be able to pick up a Greek New Testament every morning and read five, six chapters and enjoy it. That's my goal. Pray over it, cry over it. It's like amazing. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the goal? Yeah, amen. Their goal is to stand up in front of people and look smart. And you know what? No matter how much Greek I learn, I'm not going to get up in front of my church and explain to them what the Greek actually says because the King James Bible is beyond any level of Greek that I will ever attain because I'm no matter how much Greek I learn, no matter how much Greek I study, no matter how fluent I get, I'm never going to know more than 54 expert scholars who spent six years translating it. So I, I'm just going to stick with the traditional King James text for preaching and teaching the Word of God, you know, because that's what people speak is English, right? We're not saying that everybody needs to learn Greek. In fact, they're the ones that are saying that. But then when they say learn Greek, they're saying, oh, just learn the grammar and syntax. What they're really saying is be at the mercy of a few guys who have written the grammar books, who've written the lexicons, who've written these Greek tools, and just be at their mercy, and they're going to tell you what it means, and shut up and believe it because we said so. And what we're saying is, you know, you can actually verify these things by learning Greek yourself and actually knowing it. The thing is, that seems very much like the papacy to me, to be completely honest. Κάθε έγραψα η μην της πιστεύωσιν εις το όνομα του Ιού του Θεού είναι αιδίτε ότι ζωήν έχετε αιώνιον και να πιστεύετε εις το όνομα του Ιού του Θεού. 
pandes gad imarton, keisterunde tis doxis to theu. Wow, you speak Greek very well. Well, ev haristo poli. Kathos yegrapte oti uk esti dikeos uve is. Ostis gar olon ton nomon tirisi, ptesi be en eni, riegonet pandon enohos. Ogad ipon mi mihepsis, ipeke mi ponepsis, ide u mihepsis, ponepsis de, yegonas paravatis nomo. Imaste oli enohi. How do you know Greek so well? Just from reading the Bible. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> then in Evcolo. My friend, she lives here 35 years. She's my Irish friend. Que then Milaya Linica? No, I can ask my sibling. So the mi ergazo meno, pistevon di de epiton di keunda tona sevi, logizete i pistis of two is di keosini. Tigar hari tieste sesos meni diatis pisteos ke tuto uk ex imon theuto doron uk ex ergon in a mi tis kafhisite. She didn't end up getting saved, but it was another good seed planet. Thanks for having us, Thank inviting you. us in. Nice yeah, to meet you. Name? My name is Melena Stefano. Stefano, see the Melena Dane. Dane? Yeah, Heropoli. Heropoli. I saw her. So we're here in Paphos, and this is where a very important Bible story took place in Acts chapter 13. Now, if you remember, Acts chapter 13 is where Paul and Barnabas are first sent out as missionaries from that church in Antioch. And when they're sent out as missionaries, the first thing they do, they head to Seleucia, and then boom, they sail to the Isle of Cyprus. And so the first Bible stories involving that missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas take place right here on the island of Cyprus. Uti men un ek pefthendes ipo tu pnevmatos tu aiu kartilthon istin selefkian ekithen te apeplesan istin Kipron. Ke genomeni en salamini katingelon ton logon tu theu en de synagoges ton judeon ihon de ke joanin ipireti diothondes de tin mison achripafu Evron tinamagon, pseudo profitin, judeon, o onoma varisus, os in sin to antipato sergio pablo, andri sineto, utos proscalesamenos varnavan kesavlon epezitisen acuse ton logon to theu, antista to de aftis elimas o magos, uto gar meterminevete to onoma avtu, Ziton diastrepse ton antipaton apotis pisteos. Savlos de o que Pavlos plis this penevmatos aiu que atenisas is afton ipen o plinis pandos dolu que pasis ragiorgias ye diavolu ek thre pasis de que osinis u pavsi diastrephon tas odus kiriu tas eftias. Que nin idu hir tu kiriu epise Ke esi tiflos, mi vlepon ton ilion achrikeru. Para chrima de pepesen epafton achlis ke skotos, ke periagon eziti hiragogus. Tote idon o antipatos to yegonos epistefsen, eklisomenos epi tividahi tukiriu. So there's a man by the name of Sergius Paulus, and he's the deputy of the country, so he's a political ruler here. And the Bible says he desired to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the gospel. And so he summons Paul and Barnabas to come and evangelize him, preach the gospel to him. But when they go to give him the gospel, there's this other guy there named Elimus. And he was a false prophet, a sorcerer, and a Jew. So this is three strikes. I mean, he's a very bad guy. 
And he's there opposing, resisting, contradicting what the Apostle Paul is preaching. And I've had this happen to me many times out soul winning, where I'm giving the gospel to someone receptive, and then some bozo comes along and just kind of creates a lot of confusion, contradicts you, speaks against the Word of God, and just ruins it. So that's what was happening. Well, the Apostle Paul just lays into this guy and calls him a child of the devil and says, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And then he strikes him with blindness. So this is a miracle that the Apostle Paul was able to do where he strikes the man with blindness. And when that happened, of course, Sergius Paulus was amazed by that. The Bible says he believed. And then it says that he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And I've always loved that phrase because even though he'd seen this amazing miracle, the thing that really astonished him was the doctrine. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest miracle that there is. I mean, the doctrine of the Word of God is what really changes lives. You know, the miracles are cool, but the doctrine of the Lord is the thing that actually is the most life-changing. So here we are this week on the island of Cyprus, and we are picking up where Paul and Barnabas left off. As many others have done throughout the centuries, today in 2019, we are continuing to preach the gospel on the island of Cyprus. Yeah, so being a Bible-believing Christian in Europe is definitely a very lonely thing because there are very little Christians here. You feel like you're alone many times. Like in Cyprus, there are no local churches which are right on the gospel and which are you know, preaching the word of God as they should. Um, and there is practically no fellowship, unfortunately. So it's definitely a hard thing to be a Christian in Europe. But I think that slowly, slowly with, with the internet, I mean, things are starting to improve because people are listening to preaching and many of them are converting to Christianity. That's how I converted to Christianity. So I think that this is something definitely something to look forward to and that, well, we have a lot of blessings by God. I mean, there are, Pastor Anderson is here and we have great fellowship here. So I think that although things are hard right now in Europe for Christians, that they will improve in the future. We would love for, for people from America who are Bible-believing Christians to come to Cyprus and Greece, and especially people who study Greek at a Bible school, come here, preach the gospel and, you know, have fellowship with us. That would be amazing because, you know, we need that very much here. All right, so being a Bible-believing Christian in Europe is basically like being a needle in a haystack. Um, we need help. We need revival in Europe. We need uh, an army of soul winners uh, to get together, band together as brethren and start evangelizing, start getting serious about soul winning. I've come out from Scotland to meet Pastor Anderson uh, with the intention of becoming more adept at soul winning. My friends at home who are unsaved, when I give them the gospel, they don't want to hear it. And what I tell them is, listen, if you believed in God, okay, you believe in the Bible, you believe there is a hell, and you will go there if you don't have Jesus Christ. And I, if I was to not tell you that, how, how hateful would I be? What kind of friend would I be? What kind of person would I be? So we need to have this mentality all together, band together to create revival. People are not going to get saved if we're not out soul winning. The reason that we've come here to Cyprus, the reason why I make this film, and the reason I think this film is so important, is that it gets us out of our academic circles. It gets us out of just thinking of the scriptures, and especially in studying the Greek New Testament, that it's not just a exercise in knowledge and theology and debate, but it's a practical weapon and a tool, no matter what language it's translated into, that we're supposed to get out here, and being here in Cyprus has really taught me over the past week that people are still in need of the gospel everywhere we go. We get stuck in our little groups, our little cliques, our theological debates online and in person with people, uh, with other believers. When we could be out here winning souls for Christ, whether it's in Cyprus or otherwise, 
But to all the guys out there that are studying Greek, especially my Reformed brethren, we need to bring this into the field. Whether it's in our preaching, our, our pastoring, but especially even out here in Cyprus and in Greece and other Greek-speaking places, they can understand this very book. And as we study it, and as we learn how to speak the language, we can come here and win people to Christ. We can fulfill the Great Commission simply with this book. And it's no longer just an uh, idea, and it's no longer just a debate. It's a, no longer a theory or a language to be parsed, but it's pointing us to the person of Christ. And it's pointing us to what we're supposed to be doing and fulfilling the Great Commission of Christ. Now, I know that there are going to be some people who watch this film and they will just refuse to acknowledge what we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, that modern Greek and Koine Greek are mutually intelligible. But to those people, I would say, you need to do some serious introspection and ask yourself, why are you even learning Greek? Why even study the Bible for that matter? The Bible says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And so if your desire is just to learn Greek, as a mental exercise or to be puffed up or to stand up behind your pulpit and look so smart by going back to this Greek word and that word to try to impress people. You know, you can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but if you have not charity, you are nothing. This film is about taking the Greek New Testament and using it, not just enshrining it, not just dissecting it and looking at it with a microscope, but getting out there in the field and using it to win people to Christ. There are precious people all over Europe that are dying and going to hell. Who's going to reach them with the gospel? And even just in Greece and Cyprus alone, there are over 12 million people, many of which are very receptive to the gospel if someone would just bring it to them. If they would hear the gospel, they would get saved. So it's time for you Bible college students out there to take a field trip and to get out there and use Greek. Because the Bible talks about strong meat belonging to those who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We learn the Word of God by using the Word of God. And you're still on the milk if you're not out doing the work. The one who understands the Bible is the one who does the work of God. There are the forgetful hearers and there are the doers of the work. So it's time to look in the mirror, look into that perfect law of liberty and understand why we are even reading the Bible, whether in English or Greek, why are we even learning the Bible in the first place? It's so that we can be equipped unto every good work. Now, I'm going to have to give you guys um, some Greek tonight. Um, and it's not because I want to show off, because I'm not that good anyways. Because the Greek word rendered temptation, prosmos, as I've shared on many occasions, is defined by Strong's, and you can look it up for yourself. Somebody asked me, where do you get these definitions? I looked it up and, well, just look up Look it up in Strong's. But you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew to make use of the numbering system. So the numbers are very important for word studies, accurate word studies using Greek and Hebrew without having to learn Greek and Hebrew. The Bible says we're his workmanship. That word in Greek is the word poema. It means poem. We get the word poem from it. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's poem. You are God's work of art. There's nobody like you. Quit trying to be somebody else. But I want you to know in the New Testament, the word worship is defined in the Greek language as this, licking the hands of the master like a dog. A dog licking the master's hands. Dogs know how to worship. The English word preaching in the New Testament translates
almost always two Greek words, euangelizomai and keruso. Euangelizomai is a speaking of one who's bringing good news of great joy, right? The preacher is euangelizomaiing all the time, even if he's talking about hell. He ran. See that? It's a Greek word that means sprint. Middle Eastern noblemen don't sprint. Old men don't sprint. Middle Eastern noblemen don't run, they glide. Like a sort of Arabic moonwalk. The word is drachme. It means a precious silver. It wasn't just an iron or a base metal, but it was a valuable silver. The word hell means Hades or Sheol. It doesn't necessarily mean fire. It simply means the unseen state of the dead. Don't let anybody flim flam you. That's what it meant in the Old Testament. It meant that's where the dead are, that's where they go, and we can't see them. So they go to Sheol. In the Old Testament, they go to Hades in the New. Hades in the New Testament is far more pagan in thought than Sheol of the Old Testament. Obviously, we saw on the last program that Stephen Anderson claims to read the Greek New Testament like cover to cover and all the rest of this stuff. I don't believe it for a moment. You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned, and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. 
You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me, and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I could do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus, okay? But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what if all our, we did all these wonderful works, why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me, I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me, I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.